Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the San Diego Unified School District press conference today. I'm Maureen McGee, I'm the communications director and before we get started I wanted just to kind of go over uh, the protocols for today. Um, our speakers will be in the following order. Dr. John Lee Evans, our board president, will um, get us started. Uh, he'll turn it over to Superintendent Cindy Martin. Uh, the next speaker will be Sam Atisha from Cox Communications. Mahogany Taylor, who's the president of the San Diego Unified Council of PTAs. Um, she'll hand it off to Keisha Borden, president of the San Diego Education Association. Donis Cornell, executive director of the Administrator Association of San Diego City Schools, will take it from there and turn it over to our final speaker, uh, Richard Barrera, the vice president of the Board of Education. Following our speakers, we will open it up for questions from reporters. You'll see a little button at the bottom of your screen where you can raise your hand. And um, all members of the media who've identified themselves and their news agency will be called on for questions. Anything that we don't get to today, please contact me and I'll help you get any unanswered questions um, taken care of. Um, also, if anyone would like to listen to this in Spanish, you can uh, go down at the end of your um, screen there and click on the language interpretation button. Uh, you can click on Spanish, but be sure to mute the original um, uh, interpretation button there as well. Uh, so I think we will get started now uh, with Dr. John Lee Evans. Thank you, Maureen. I'm, I'm John Lee Evans, President of the San Unified School Board, and we're here today to announce the beginning of formal graded instruction in Sandy Unified starting on March 27th. Now, a lot of instruction has already been happening over the past several weeks, weeks, but we're now entering into this very formal organized period. The eyes of the city, the state, and the nation are all on San Diego because we've really been leading the way in terms of coming up with a comprehensive uh, distance learning program. On March 10th, we gave the superintendent emergency powers as the crisis was ramping up and the schools were formally closed on uh, March 16th. At that time, we had uh, three concerns, which were one, the health and safety of the students, number two was nutrition, and number three was the educational mission that we have. At that time, we thought we were gonna be closed until April 6th, but then it became apparent that it was not going to happen uh, anytime soon, and so we began taking other measures. First of all, we immediately made sure that all the students we're receiving the meals that they needed through our, our lunch and breakfast programs. And then we began working on a distance learning program since we had no end date in sight. And there are two reasons why we can be successful with a distance learning program. One is our teachers who've been very well prepared and also the technology that we've had for the past 10 years. And one thing that will distinguish our online learning program from other ones is that these teachers already have personal relationships with uh, all of their students. So we're gonna hear more about the distribution of the computers to the students. But one thing on the Board of Education that we have said is we will not be satisfied until every student is reached and is participating and is participating in a meaningful way. And we do believe that our students and teachers will be able to rise to this occasion. Uh, we're saying yes to new material, yes to grading, and yes to preparing our students for the next level. This means that the, our seniors will be able to graduate with the credits that they need. It also means that we will be continually preparing our kindergartners uh, for the first grade. Now make no doubt about it, we realize that this is a heavy lift. We have been teaching in the classroom in San Diego Unified for 166 years, and in a little over one month, we are ramping up a, a completely new distance learning program. There will be a lot of problems along the way, but the good news is that we have a great team of problem solvers. Now, I know the question that everybody is asking is, when are we going to go back to the classroom? <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have a very clear answer for that, which is we do not know. This is going to depend on the virus. It's going to depend on our public uh, health officials telling us when we can go back. But our point is we will be prepared when that day comes. And we're not counting on a soon return. So we're going to continuously improve our distance learning. And, and if the return is gradual, we'll be able to augment the distance learning with the uh, in-classroom learning. We're not gonna sit around and stop and wait for any particular date. Now, I'd just like to say a couple of things as psychologists about anxiety, the anxiety that all of us are experiencing during this time. And first of all, in terms of talking to kids, the best way you can talk to your kids 
is first of all, ask them what they understand about what's going on, what they know. They've been overhearing conversations, they've been listening to TV, they've talked to their friends, and the best information you can give them is based on what they know now, because it may very, be very different than what you think that they know at this point. And then you can explain it at an age-appropriate level. But for all of us experiencing anxiety, uh, there's, there are two factors, the things that are under control and that are not under our control. And our problem is we tend to put too much of our energy into those factors that are not under our control. And that drains some of the energy that we could use for the factors that are under our control. So in specific, in terms of education at this point, we can focus on the education of our children. This is gonna provide them stability. It's gonna provide them stimulation. Uh, they can have a schedule and this will actually help their mental, emotional health, as well as continue their academic achievement. Mm -hmm. And a little later, we will talk about the, the great financial crisis that we are facing. Uh, in a recent federal stimulus package of $2 trillion, only one half of 1% uh, went to public schools. So Vice President Barrera will be speaking about this later. As a Board of Education, we can only set the policy. We can have aspirational goals, but it's really up to the superintendent and her team to carry this out. And they have been doing this in a very rapid manner with a yes we can attitude. And that's why the, the focus of the nation has been on our city, our, our district, and our superintendent, Cindy Martin. So now I'd like to introduce our Sandy Unified School District Superintendent, Cindy Martin. Thank you, President Evans. Thank you everybody for joining today. I wanna to start with a thank you to our Board of Education for your extraordinary leadership. The focus of our district has always been clear around equity, around excellence, and executing our plans this board has been very clear and has not changed its priorities. So thank you to the extraordinary leadership of the San Diego Unified Board of Education. Thank you to our staff for their inspirational leadership. All across our district, our principals, our teachers, our food service workers, our police services, all across the district. Dr. Evans said, everybody is committed to a yes we can figure this out, work together, an extraordinary inspirational leadership of the entire staff and the executive leadership team who has worked tirelessly to ensure that we are able to stay on mission and deliver what our students deserve during this unprecedented crisis. A deep thank you from me to all staff and to our parents. You will hear from Mahogany later. Thank you to our parents. We know that these are challenging times for you, and we know that you are stepping up to the challenge to be partners with us in doing this work. Thank you to our parents, and thank you to our students for all of your hard work. Your dedication is also inspirational, and I'm so proud to see what is unfolding before my eyes. I have to say thank you to our city. Thank you to the city of San Diego for stepping up. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. One more thank you. Thank you to all of our reporters and the journalists that are on the call today. The media has been doing an exceptional job in helping us communicate the process to our city. And on this point specifically, I wanna refer you to the very clear data that's showing a connection between how well a society is responding to this COVID crisis, the existence of a free press. So thank you to the media and to the journalists that are helping us talk to the city. There's a clear link. San Diego Unified entered this crisis with two strong legs to stand on, our technology and our teachers. We are a one-to-one -one device district with a computer available to every student. That's not new for us. And our teachers are some of the best in the nation. They are the best at reaching students with all kinds of learning styles and challenges and gifts, strengths, talents, and abilities. This is not just my opinion about the excellence of our educators. The Learning Policy Institute and others have noted the exceptional skills and the dedication of the professional educators in the San Diego Unified School District. From the very beginning, we've said that we have two goals. This year needs to count for our students. This crisis can't mean lost time for our students. That's number one. Number two, we've said that the learning we provide will be open for all students. This crisis might change how we operate, but it doesn't change who we are. We care deeply about academic excellence for all students, 
and equity for all students. So what I'm here to do, what I'm here today to do is to report back to the city on our progress towards achieving these goals that we've set out to do in this unprecedented time. So far to date, we've distributed more than a half a million meals, more than 47,000 Chromebooks. Teachers have taken part in more than 13,000 hours of professional development. We're also starting to see the results of these efforts because close to 90%, 88.6% of all of our students have connected to school during the soft launch period. This is the biggest challenge public education has faced in a generation. And our schools and our students are rising to meet this challenge. But we have much more work to do. If your family is experiencing food insecurity, please visit our website so you can see the list of the convenient locations that we have for you to access food and nutrition. If you still need a laptop or an internet connection, we want you to go to your local distribution site today, tomorrow, or next week. And if you need help with this, you can call 619-260-260. 60. If you need help troubleshooting an issue with one of your with the Chromebook or the device, you can call 619-732-1400. I want to talk briefly about what parents could be expecting for next week. We know thousands of teachers have been reaching out to their students and getting real work done during the soft launch period that will only continue to get stronger next week. We have a distance learning checklist on our COVID website under resources, but most important thing is to come up with a plan that works for you and your family. We're here to support you every step of the way. We expect every student who is able to join class to do so and to do their best. Teachers will be grading their work They'll be giving feedback. And I want to remind everyone that we have a grade protection plan in place. I'm sure you'll have questions and I will be happy to answer those. But I want to introduce some of the people who've made this progress that I've just reported on possible. So I'm going to start by introducing Sam Atisha from Cox Communications. We already have in San Diego Unified Business Class Internet in all of our schools, thanks to Cox Communications. We asked for four months of free service to help families get through the end of the year. And once again, Cox Communications stepped up for our students. It's my pleasure to introduce Sam Atisha from Cox Communications. Thanks for being our partner and support in this, Sam. Thank you, Cindy. Um, uh, Superintendent Martin and uh, Dr. Evans, I really appreciate everything that you and your entire teams are doing uh, to, and I love what you said, to make sure this year counts and continue the school year from home. Um, I hope everyone is well and safe, and I appreciate the opportunity to represent our company to really share with you the efforts that we're focused on to make sure that that school year continues from home. Um, since 2012, we've had an amazing partnership with San Diego Unified School District to really focus on bridging the digital divide through Cox's Connect to Compete program, now that uh, Superintendent Martin sometimes calls Connect to Learn, which I think is a great name. Um, and uh, really, the program is simple. Qualifying families receive high-speed internet for $9.95 a month and in-home Wi-Fi, enabling multiple students and family members to connect to a reliable and fast high-speed internet connection in their home so they can do homework, connect with their teachers and classmates. and. Um, you know, during these times, we've had to make some significant adjustments, and we know we're blessed, I'm blessed to work for a company that has the means and the focus on the community, and I know during these uncertain times, school districts are reinventing their models and really trying to figure out how to continue the school year, and so our focus now is to commit to help as many school districts and kids get online to finish out the school year, and so we announced uh, on March 13th that Connect to Compete was going to be extended for free for two months until May 15th. And what that meant was kids would get two months of free internet, plus we doubled the bandwidth from 25 megabits to 50 megabits, and we were also providing desktop and free technical support. 
obviously we, we have more to do and with everything going on and continuing, unfortunately, we've decided to extend that offer to July 15th. So folks that sign up by May 15th will get free internet until July 15th. And so we're really proud to do our part to help kids transition to home to make sure this school year counts. And uh, for those of you that need uh, more information, you can go to cox.com C to C. The other big thing we did is we fast tracked and pre-qualified as many households as we could into the program. As I mentioned, we have an amazing partnership with the San Diego Unified team. And they had originally given us a list of about 18,000 addresses to really look at that were, I think, the most vulnerable folks that they had that really they wanted to make sure that had internet access. And after doing some research, I'm really excited to say that more than 10,000 of those addresses are connected to Cox today, either through Connect to Compete or a traditional Cox offering. And the additional addresses were all pre-qualified and fast-tracked into our approval process. So those households just need to fill out the application either through the school district or through their resource centers or directly through the Cox website, and we will get them a self-install kit of being able to get onto the internet uh, quickly. In just the last few weeks alone, we've had 1,500 new families get on to the platform. So we're working as fast as we can. We're fully committed to helping not only San Diego Unified, but all of our school districts in San Diego County get kids on uh, the internet. And uh, you know, I gotta give a big shout out to the district. They're one of the few one-to-one -one districts end-to-end. -end. Other school districts, if you need a device, we have some great computer partners here in San Diego. Computers to Kids, which is also a partner of the school districts, has a number of devices that people can get to help them get online. Um, and so I'm really proud of our company and our commitment, and I appreciate the leadership of uh, Superintendent Martin and San Diego Unified. You know, we're uh, a company that was founded by a teacher in 1898. James Cox founded our company with a newspaper, and we've always supported local education. And today our employees are more committed than ever to support school districts. And uh, the last 10 years, the investment that we've made in our network here in San Diego County is really enabling us to support, you know, tens of thousands of people now working from home and schooling from home. And so our commitment is to not only keep our network up and running to make sure the experience is there so kids can connect with their teachers in the school district, but also help give back. And in just this very short period of time, we've already made more than $8 million in cash and in-kind contributions due to COVID-19. And we'll continue to do that and play our role in, in getting San Diego back to a healthy and vibrant community. But I really just wanna say uh, on behalf of all of our employees, Superintendent Martin, Dr. Evans, the entire school board and all of the teachers and staff, Appreciate the opportunity to partner with you and to uh, extend the learning environment to the home and make sure, I love that phrase, I'm going to borrow it, um, Superintendent, is make sure this year counts for all. So thank you. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, Mahogany Taylor, who's the San Diego Unified Council of PTA's president. Thank you, Sam. Um, the PTA has been working with San Diego Unified for over 100 years. We're a group of volunteers that are here to um, support children's education um, and make sure that the voices of parents and students are heard. We've been partnering with the district and um, SDEA uh, for many years and continuing the partnership um, during this time. Our main concern has been making sure that families are informed and there's communication flowing um, quickly and um, efficiently between the district teachers um, and our parents. We understand our parents are taking a large um, teacher jobs put on um, by now also being um, a teacher in the home. And so we have been reaching out to families um, across the district to see what has been working, where we can have improvement, and just making sure that they understand that their voices are heard and that we are working with um, the district and SDEA in order to make sure that our children's education will continue um, during this time of crisis. And we just really hope to continue this as the rollout of grading continues and we are gonna be here um, continuing to support our families and our students. I'd like to introduce one of our partners, uh, Keisha Borden, the SDEA president. Thank you, Mahogany. Um, I just wanna start out by saying I appreciate the work that we're all doing together as educators, as parents, um, and public education advocates to get through this crisis safely and to maintain the relationships and connections that are the foundation 
of um, education. Uh, Superintendent Martin and the board leadership have been extremely collaborative and mindful in their planning. Um, this has been a very productive partnership. We've come together to find solutions to problems that we're facing that are facing both students and educators and families. Um, and together we're working to hold the gains that we've made with our students in spite of years of austerity and cuts to public education. Um, so it, it says something positive about our work, our district, and our shared vision for public education that we're here together today as district leadership, as educators and parents. And, and I want to thank uh, Cindy and Mahogany for your commitment to our schools and our students. I also want to thank the teacher volunteers and the classified staff who are at our school sites every single weekday providing essential meals for our families. I'm, I'm thankful that our families are continuing to be are continuing to be served during this crisis. Um, every teacher knows that face-to-face -face instruction and learning in a classroom is what works best for students, but that option is not available to us at this moment. This is an emergency. Uh, this is crisis teaching. And so while this crisis disrupted those critical connections and relationships between educators and students, it did not and it will not end those relationships. So we're all working together to implement a distance learning program that first and foremost keeps people safe and connected and that works to ensure access and equity for all of our students, families, and educators. So as you can imagine, teachers have been working extremely long hours for the past month. Even in normal times, teachers put in long work hours. We get there before school starts and we stay um, for hours after the final bell. <clears throat> and teachers are still putting in those long hours. In fact, many of our educators spent their entire spring break. They've been spending their weekends attempting to recreate their classrooms online. We also want to be mindful of the amount of time our students are on their screens engaging in distance learning. And we want to echo the district's recommendations for limiting screen time based on grade level or age. We are not replicating the full school day online. There is an abundance of academic research that warns that too much time in front of computer screens is not good for kids or anyone for that matter. Um, so grace and flexibility are very critical at this moment. Um, and as this crisis has exposed everyone to the real inequalities in our society <clears throat> and to the disproportionate burden that is placed on our school system as providers of not only education, but basic social services like food, healthcare, and mental health counseling. Um, I wanna remind all of us, our educators, parents, principals, that this is a time to support each other as we all wrestle with what it means to teach without a classroom without the resources and tools and relationships that make up the very fabric of our schools, which really do function as the heart of our communities. Let's work to be kind to each other, to be graceful and flexible, and remember that we're so much stronger together and that together we can stay safe, we can stay connected, we can continue to advocate for the schools all our students need and deserve. And on behalf of our 6,500 uh, professional educators, we are ready for next week. Thank you. And I'll hand it off to Donis Cornell. Hi, thank you, Keisha. Um, I am the executive director of the Administrators Association that represents over 550 school principals vice principals, and other operational managers and supervisors. And for the past month, all of our members, but particularly our principals, have worked day and night to help students in need. Um, this has not been an easy task. It is probably, when I talk to the uh, most experienced uh, principal, it's probably the hardest thing that they have ever done. And they would not have been able to get there without the relationships and the um, good good teamwork with our teachers because that is what is making it work at the school sites um, we also have a lot of operational folks out there that are working on behalf of all of our students which are our food services supervisors our police personnel our custodial personnel and our maintenance folks that are not um, 
staying home right now. They are out in the workforce keeping our schools safe and providing food for the students. But our principals really have taken on a heavy load and it has um, probably been very eye-opening for them. They tell many stories of, of finding students in places they never thought to even look for them. Um, some of our students, as you know, come from uh, maybe uh, family situations where they, they're not living right now where they normally live because of the situation. And the principals have really tracked them down and evidenced by, the, by Cindy Martin's um, figures of almost 90% of students that have been found. And we're so grateful for the work of the, of the school administrators, the principals, the vice principals, and also our teachers who are, we know are very instrumental in helping us connect with the kids. Um, when I talk to principals, and I do talk to them pretty much every day, um, the experiences they share just warm my heart. Um, we, we have principals that uh, found out that perhaps a family had someone pass away from COVID-19, and um, the mother couldn't leave the home because they have a special needs child in the home. So the principal connected with a program manager at the district level who took food to the family and so on. So the stories just continue to come out every day of wonderful things that um, everybody in our school district is doing for, for others. But at the end of the day, when I talk to our principals, what I hear them say in a number, a variety of ways is, we need to give kids a reason to come back to us the next day. And that's the leadership of the principal, that's the work of the, of the teacher, that's the work of our folks distributing food, and we just need to give the kids a reason to say, I want to go back to school the next day, even though it's not the school that they're typically used to going to. And that's important to our folks. And so with um, that, I would just like to close by saying that I want um, the Board of Education to know, I want the superintendent to know, and I want everyone out there to know that our principals, our vice principals, and our leadership team is ready to go Monday. We're going to make this work. We're actually excited about it, and um, the the uh, the just the excitement that I'm hearing from our our people about Monday um, shows me that they are ready. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Vice President Richard Barrera. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Donna. It's, it's so inspiring uh, to hear uh, everybody's remarks today, and it's. Um, and it's, it's familiar in our district, frankly, to see that, especially during times of crisis, uh, we all pull together with a CISA Pueda attitude because we know that our kids are relying on us uh, to, to make our schools work for them. Our schools, we've all, everybody um, that is uh, associated with public schools in our community and across the country recognize what public schools really mean to our society. Our public schools are the great equalizer. Uh, they make possible that no matter the circumstances that a student comes into our schools with, uh, our public schools are gonna make possible that that student can grow up and be a contributor in our society. That's what public schools have meant to all of us uh, here on this, on this call today. We know also that, and I think yeah, I heard Donna speak to it, I heard uh, Keisha speak to it, so many of our families are struggling right now. You know, in, in before this crisis, two thirds of the families in our district uh, live uh, below the poverty line. We've got nearly 6,000 homeless students. We know that that's the reality of, uh, of, of uh, what our families face all the time. However, during this crisis, we know that what is happening to our families, particularly in terms of people losing their jobs. We've got many families who are not able to access the federal assistance because of restrictions on uh, people who are documented. Our families are in crisis right now even more than they've been in the past. That's why as a community we're, ra we're rallying behind them, but we also need to recognize that as we're so focused right now on doing what we can, we have to think about where we're gonna be in just a few months. And the reality that is very clear is that the money that pays for our public schools 
is the money that comes in primarily to the state of, state of California in the form of tax revenue. That tax revenue we know is being depleted every day. And by the time we expect in probably August or September that the governor and the state of California are able to clarify what the impact of this economic downturn has been to our tax revenues, we are gonna see the greatest hit uh, to potentially to the public school system that we've ever seen in the history of this district. So right at the time that we are hopefully starting up the new school year, and at the moment that our students more than ever are in need of a stable, thriving school system, at the moment that our communities more than ever are in need of schools that really provide the glue to a community, and of course the hope for the future, we are potentially facing the most devastating budget cuts that we have ever seen, budget cuts that could dwarf what we saw uh, when John and I came onto the board 12 years ago in the last recession. So here's what we need to do together as well as the work that we're doing right now to support our students. We need to rally as a community in the way that San Diegans have done many times before. You know, when Sam talked about uh, our district being unique and that we have our one-to-one -one devices, that we have the infrastructure that we've worked with Cox to build at our schools, that's not by accident. That's because three times in the past 12 years, the voters of San Diego have been willing to approve bond measures that require sacrifice from taxpayers in order to invest in our schools. That's why we have the infrastructure that we do today, because San Diego, San Diego voters have taken a Cisa Pueda attitude towards our schools. What we are asking today is that if you are a teacher, if you are a parent, if you are a food service worker, a bus driver, custodian, if you're a student, if you're an administrator, if you are a person in our community that cares about our public schools, please make contact today with your member of Congress and with Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris. And that is because we need to see in the upcoming federal stimulus package that schools rise to the top as the number one priority. Dr. Evans mentioned that in the last stimulus bill, which was important for the overall economy, but less than one half of 1% of the funding went to our public schools. We know that our public schools are in desperate need of hundreds of billions of dollars from the federal government in this next stimulus package. The federal government has the ability to make that investment. Collectively, by the way, across the nation, public schools are the largest employer in this country. So when we talk about the uh, support that's gone to employers to help workers weather through this crisis, we simply cannot afford to have massive cuts to the public school system in just a few months when we open again. So as San Diegans have always done, it's time again to stand up for our students and to advocate to your members of Congress that we need to see major, major investment in the next federal stimulus for our public schools so that our public schools can continue to do what they always do which is to stabilize communities in the, in the present and to create hope for the future. That's what we've always done together as San Diegans, and now more than ever, we need to lead the way, not only here locally, but across this nation, to make sure that the federal government invests in our public schools. And with that, I will turn it back over to Maureen, uh, and we will now take questions from reporters. Great, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, Jamie Reese from the communications team is gonna help me um, facilitate these questions. Uh, so when we call on you, please uh, remind us who you are and what news outlet you represent. And if there is anyone on the panel in particular you're directing your question to, let us know. Otherwise, we'll um, just let the experts um, take it from there. Um, okay. Okay, hi, it's Jamie here. So I have Will Hunsbury with Voice of San Diego. I'm gonna unmute you, Will, and then you can go ahead and ask your question. 
Okay, go ahead. Okay, uh, hey there, everybody. Um, you can hear me, right? Yes. So, obviously, uh, this, this question is for Superintendent Martin, I think. Um, you guys have done a really great job, I think, with trying to make sure students get connected and make sure teachers are up to speed on teaching. Um, and those are things in your control, as kind of Dr. Evans mentioned. But um, I'm, I'm wondering if we can have like um, a courageous conversation, to use uh, some of superintendent's language, about um, how much parent participation has to be involved when it comes to education. You know, I've heard parents saying they really appreciate what the district is doing, but they're still kind of like really throwing their hands up because online education requires so much from them and they have literally zero to give. So can you kind of talk me through what online education really looks like. We keep saying that word, but no one really knows what it means. And is there a way that it, that it doesn't involve so much parent participation or is that just have to be a huge part of it? Thank you, Will, for that question. And I see Mahogany smiling too. She's at home with her two kids and I've been Zoom meeting with her while the kids need her support. So we understand that parents absolutely are having a critical role in this work, the work that we're doing with distance learning. And so for every family, it's different. There's not one perfect way to do this. And families are adjusting and readjusting the schedules that work for them as they in, enroll and work with the teachers for distance learning. So it's so unique and customized, but there are times when independent learning is important and there's time when structured learning with the teacher is important and that's true whether we're in brick and mortar classrooms or whether we're in this distance learning environment that kids go home with homework and they do some work independently and they do some work with the families supporting them but we're seeing the schedules and the kinds of things that that are working for families some families do, they, the parents are both working in the morning and they need the students to be more independent in the morning. And then in the afternoon, they're able to work with the family. So it, it, it really does make a difference by each family. Um, I just talked to a couple of teachers and one teacher talked about how they've structured the day and the week and making sure that we're being flexible with the variations that families are going through. So if it's all, you must log on at this time and you must be a part of the learning at this time, that might not work for a family. So we're wanting to be very flexible, as Keisha from SDEA said, have flexibility and grace in how we do that. One teacher, for example, starts every morning with a morning announcement and a class meeting and she does a song. And then after she does the song, she posts it in Google Classroom and sets the tone for the day and knows that some of her students can't log on during that time because the family has something else going on, but the family can go do that later in the day if that's when it works better for the family. Then she, that teacher is posting everything in Google, Google Classroom. She's using a tool called Loom Video, not Zoom, but Loom Video, where she can outline the day for the parents. She explains where there's a math time, where there's a read aloud time, so they can log in for that. She's got a video for parents on Class Dojo that gives them some advice about how to engage in the learning. She, she has some math work that she's doing that's supplemental. She has a brain break that there's a PE coach for an hour where they call that a brain break, break and gives them something to do during that time. Um, wants to make sure there's exercise built in. We're worried about our students being home and not being able to exercise and continue to have the physical exercise that we know is important. So. Our PE department has posted really great resources. Our VAPA visual and performing arts department has posted great resources. Um, this one teacher has a read aloud every day where the teacher's reading and it, it's recorded. So if you can't log in when it's happening, you can come up with that schedule. The same teacher has science lessons posted. So it's over, there's flexibility over a one day, two day period. And I think it's important that families look at the course of the week, the course of a day, and build a schedule that works for your family, knowing that there's a lot of different needs. We have some parents who are in the medical profession and they're working at night. So it can be very different depending on the family and the way that we're able to, to make this work. I, just, I also wanna say that teachers are available 
to help with this, to help you problem solve and to engage with the students daily. They might involve connecting with them via Zoom. They could be conducting the morning meeting. They could be having a digital discussion or a lecture. It could be something that's held later that they log into, but we're available to help our families navigate this and be partners with them while this happens. Okay, so our next question comes from Joe Hong from KPBS. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, Joe. Okay, perfect. Hey, Joe, can you go ahead and recite your question? Yeah, sure. Um, so what are the current plans for uh, continuing instruction into the summer, whether it be by expanding summer school or by extending the school year? Let me take that one. Yes. Okay. Hi, Joe. Thank you for that question. Um, when we talk about summer school, there's ideas in people's head. Of what does summer school actually mean? Um, and people's understanding and past experience of summer school. I'd like to talk about this in the context of learning loss. And there is, a, there's going to be learning loss nationwide. We have over a hundred countries actually worldwide that have closed the school systems countrywide. And so all of the leaders and educa educators across the country are thinking about what do we do to make up for the learning loss. And as Dr. Evans said at the beginning of this press conference, is there some things that we don't know? And so there's certain things that we can't plan for and there's certain things that we can plan for. We made it clear in our advocacy that Richard Barrera spoke about around this idea of, of addressing learning loss through some type of extending model, whether it's, we call it summer school or extending a school year, that we know it's gonna cost money and there needs to be an investment in that. But how it actually looks is dependent upon the current health advisories and health advice that we're getting by the, by the health officials. And so we can't say, is it brick and mortar? Is it for everybody? Is it for some? What do we need to actually look more broadly and systemically long-term? How would we make up for that learning loss? And what will, when will that be? When will we be able to do that? And what will be the right environment to do that in? Okay, so right. our, next, our okay. next question comes from Kristen uh, with San Diego Union Tribune. I'm gonna go ahead and unmute her. Okay, Kristen, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I have kind of a multi-part, sorry, a multi-part question about uh, the Chromebooks and logins. Um, first of all, uh, Superintendent Martin, can you just clarify what the 88.6% uh, number was for? Was it like for students who logged on to an LMS or students who uh, like teachers have heard from? Um, just what does that number exactly mean? And then also, can you um, talk about attend, uh, like, is our teachers going to track attendance or how will that work um, throughout the rest of the school year? Um, just like, will you be taking attendance or how would, yeah, just how would that work if it's so um, different and more flexible now? Oh, and sorry, I had a third question. I don't know if I should wait till later, but um, do you plan to plan, uh, pass out more Chromebooks and how many more? Oh, okay, thank you, Kristen. I'll try to get all three of those questions and if I forget one, we'll circle back. Um, so when we talked about 88.6%, nearly 90 um, percent of our students logging in, we knew when we started this that we were passing out the Chromebooks and making sure students had connectivity. And so we wanted to know during the soft launch, are students connecting? Have they logged in to their active directory, which is how they access all of the, you said LMS, which I'll, I'll translate for people that don't know what that means. It's learning management systems, but there, we have many, many learning management systems and educational apps that our students are used to using in their classroom, in their environments with their teachers. And rather than checking by each and every app, we have an aggregate number of nearly 90% of our students have logged in at least once during this time, during the soft launch. And what we're doing, at, I think that was the first part of your question. And your second question is, going forward starting Monday, what happens during that time? At that point, we'll be tracking particip participation, not attendance. This period has been, the soft launch period has been about connectivity. We needed to make sure that we've made contact. We mean quite literally, if you can't reach, you can't teach them. So we're making sure that we've reached students, they've got their computer, they're able to log in, they have the connectivity, and that's what we're seeing is nearly 90%. Sorry, I'm gonna close my window really quick. Ah. Landscapers outside, sorry about that. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so during the soft launch, I wanted to remind everyone also that we are still in the soft launch. We actually have until tomorrow to complete that. There are still some schools have their scheduled pickup time is today and tomorrow. So the numbers are continuing to evolve each day. We originally thought that we would be needing to distribute 40,000 Chromebooks. We're over 50,000 at this point. We have enough to meet any one of the needs. And um, that we that come our way. That's part of what we want to say today. The number I passed that I said earlier is about if you don't yet have your computer and you're not yet logged on, call this number so we can make sure you have your computer and you have the connectivity that you need to continue learning. And I also want to remind folks that where this is the information is around our traditional schools, year-round schools are, are not, they start their kind of soft launch part of this and, and getting themselves connected, that starts next week. So there's more computers and more things that we'll be sure that we're passing out. They've had access to pick up their computers throughout this soft launch period, but we know some of the students that are year round and those teachers are getting up to speed as their schedule begins next week to move into formal graded instruction. That's about 10% of our schools. I think your the third question was, how many more Chromebooks do you intend on passing out? Was that it, Kristen? Yeah, do you need to pass out more, or are there still students who don't have one or need one? Well, we've always said in Tango Unified, we define equity by knowing our students by name and by need and ensuring each and every student has what he or she needs when they need it in the way that they need it. Our initial data during the soft launch, they're finding their way to the distribution center. If they need a computer, they're getting it. We're finding students who before this might have said, I don't need a computer, we've got computers at home, but you might be talking about a family with two adults and four children that are all engaged in distance learning and normally one or two computers in that home was fine and now it's not. So you're seeing families coming to pick up computers that previously might have said they don't need one, they're fine. Um, so it was real hard for us to identify for sure how many do we need. And so, like I said, we had planned on 40,000. We're up to 50,000 by the time we're finished tomorrow with the soft launch. Well, I don't want to estimate, but whatever it is, we've actually harvested out of our classrooms. I said earlier, we have a one-to-one -one device for every student. That's one of the strong legs we have to stand on as a district. So these computers are in the charging carts in the classroom. Our team, led by Torin Allen and a whole team of people that Donna's recognized earlier, are helping to harvest those computers out of the classrooms and put them in the distribution center. So whatever the demand is, we are going to be able to meet that when it comes to providing those Chromebooks to students. So as the distribution centers start to close, by Friday is the end of the formal distribution center or distribution center time, but then we will continue to have, uh, we will stand up exchange centers that once we start formal distance learning on Monday, if somebody has an issue with the computer, it's broken, it's not working, or they haven't picked up one yet for some reason, they can go to one of the exchange centers that will transition from distribution center to exchange center. And we've also provided that um, uh, phone number for IT support. Good message to anyone. If anyone's out there and they don't have a computer, please make sure that you contact us so we can make sure you have what you need so you can continue the learning. And you got to see what your teachers have planned. The teachers are really excited about this work. I appreciate Keisha talking about the dedication of our educators and the ingenuity and innovation that they've had and the way the principals are supporting them to do this. Okay, our next question comes from Mimi um, Aguila with Channel 10. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her. All right, Mimi, go ahead. Hi, yeah, my question is, what exactly will the structure look like? Will high school, middle school, and elementary schools um, all start at a certain time, and then how many hours a day will be in class, if anyone can just break that down for me? Uh, I'll, I'll refer back to what I said earlier about this being highly customized and individualized. Just like we do as professional educators in the classroom every day, there's not one style or one way or one approach that works for every single learner. We have over 100,000 students and teachers are designing the day and the week and the, the distance learning time that will work for them. And it's not the same for every single person, nor would we want it to be. That would not make sense for a family schedule, a student's different learning needs and different learning styles. We don't think six hours a day in front of a computer is ever a good practice. And it's definitely not a good practice for learning time. So as our families are getting involved with the teachers and seeing the offerings, we've put together as a district and the live teaching that's happening, the recorded teaching that's happening, working with 
families, working with parents to be able to design the structure of the learning day that will work best for them, whether they're our youngest learner or our most advanced learners. And I would refer people back to our board meeting past Tuesday when our student board member, Zach Patterson, talked about what it's like for him and some of the classes that he's taking. So I also want people to think about the teacher's day. And many of our educators are at home setting up their classroom in the virtual environment, and they have three kids of their own. So they're doing their distance learning for their own children, and then they're doing it for the children that they teach, or they have a, uh, somebody else in the home that they're taking care of, or somebody else that's needing to go to work. So structuring the days and the times is highly individualized, and it's individualized because it's best practice. It's the way that we have teaching be a craft and not a science. And so I just think it's important that everybody knows our teachers are going to continue to assess student progress. They're gonna make informal decisions about what needs, what added supports are needed for a family. And it's gonna be based on what our parents are saying they need. If a parent's like, surrender, I wave the white flag, I need some more help here. This is, I see you laughing, Mahogany, yes. <laughs> You're like, you think you got it. And we've heard from parents that think they have distance learning dialed in the first week and then, the next week it didn't work. Something changed and something's different in the family. We are here for you as a district, your teacher, your principal, the schools are here for you. And I don't know if Keisha, you wanna raise a flag there and say a couple of things because I'm telling all these stories about what our educators are doing and I know they're reaching out to you as well, Keisha. So you might wanna chime in about how we're there for parents and what the day might look like. Sure. Um like you said, every classroom is different. The needs of the students vary from classroom to classroom. Even when we were in our actual classrooms, if you went to several classrooms in a school, you're going to see different things. This is not one size fits all. Teachers uh, adjust their teaching, their curriculum to their children, the children that are in their classroom. Um, I, I spoke with Mahogany and I checked in to see how parents were doing. And the one thing that uh, came out of that conversation is we really need to make sure we're communicating. Um, I, would, I would encourage parents, reach out to your teachers and let them know, is it too much? Is it, do you need more resources? Because a lot of times only the most vocal folks are the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Um, we want to hear from every parent in our classrooms and every parent needs to let us know how is this going for you? What other resources do you need? Do you need um, less? Uh, how is this working for you? So I would definitely say communicate with the teachers. Um, our teachers are working really hard and, and they want to do the best for their kids, but we have to remember that this is not the regular school day. We're not doing six and a half hours of online learning. Um, it's just not good for kids. Um, so communication is the key. And yeah. Mahogany was, uh, thank you, Keisha. And Mahogany was waving. I know you're on mute, but you can unmute yourself if you wanna weigh in on this about how your days are changing. Each day is different. And as the teachers start connecting with your kids, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you'd like to say something as a parent, I don't wanna yeah. talk about you and not give you a chance to talk. Um, I would just say, I think that a lot of parents are feeling, uh, yes, every day kind of comes as a, different challenges. And, um, as the weeks go on, I think there'll be more um, w things that can pop up that is unknown. And the we really are encouraging all the families that we speak to to communicate to their teachers. I know like as a specific example, uh, yesterday my oldest son was really having a lot of trouble focusing um, after being five weeks in the house. So we communicated out to his teachers and my younger son's teachers and just said, you know what, today we're not going to be able to get on to your Zoom. We'll look at the classwork later in the day, but we're just going to work on some exercise. And they were very responsive and said, you know, if there's anything else that we can help you with, how can we support you? So I would encourage all families to really reach out to their teachers because they're there to help and they are going to communicate and they can provide lots of resources for you. Thank you, Mahogany. And I'm not sure if everyone can see Keisha nodding her head. I can see her, but I think you guys can only see who's speaking when they're speaking, but I appreciate Keisha's um, affirming that and knowing that teachers want to be here for you like we always are when we were in the classrooms and in this virtual setting. So please reach out. And uh, Donis, I don't know, you might want to say a little something about how our principals are supporting our families right now and giving students the reason to stay connected. And that's why we're doing participation every week and instead of attendance every day. And um, Donis, do you want to say anything about this? 
Well, I, uh, this morning I happened to talk to at one time on Zoom about six principles, uh, various levels from high school, middle school, elementary, and what you all are saying about how um, the teachers are customizing their class to the needs of the students right now was exactly what the principals were saying and they want their teachers to have the flexibility to do that because not every plan is working for every kid and the principals are really open to the to the flexibility that the teachers are offering to the families and very supportive of it so that's that's all I have to add Thank you for that anecdote of talking to the leaders and what they're experiencing and I guess I'll just wrap up that's a this is a really long answer to what a, a, a simple yet complex question, but I think what I'd like to say to, to tie this all together is our students are watching us. Our students are counting on us and watching us during this time. And Maya Angelou's quote is people remember not what you say and not what you do, but they remember how you make them feel. And we know our parents need help right now, our students need help, and all manner of things that might be easy or difficult for our families, we want to be there with them and know that this is defining us and this is going to allow us to be successful as we go through this. And it's important that we're recognizing individual families, their needs, and we're listening to you and we're here for you. And um, we're going to make sure we do this together. Um, our next question comes from Rory Devine with NBC. Rory? I'm gonna leave this in. Hold on one second. Rory, can you hear me? All right, so I don't, well, Rory can't hear me, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go to the next person then. Um, let me pull it up here. We have, um, looks like Mimi has another question. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Kristen has another question. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her. Oh, oh actually, it looks like Rory's here now. Hey, Rory, Jamie, can you, hear me? can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, Rory. Go ahead, Rory. Yes. Okay. So, um, Sorry about that, <laughs> at least in my third question, but let me start with my first one. How, um, what do you know about the homeless children and those in special ed? How are they doing? I know the distance learning must be very difficult in terms of providing that for them, but what are you doing and how is that going, number one? Number two, uh, credit, no credit. I know that Richard had said that one of the reasons you didn't go to credit, no credit was because you wanted the kids who had good grades to keep them. However, when I speak to Poway, the kids who uh, were on the quarter system were able to keep their third semester grades and then start again with the fourth semester. So I was wondering if you had uh, thought about that. And my last question, and you can only, you can answer as many as you want. My last question has to do with the fact that I'm feeling for the teachers insofar as I couldn't even get myself off of mute uh, because I know that their uh, abilities in terms of technology run the gamut. Have you done any analysis yet? Maybe this is something for the future in terms of how many teachers are on Zoom, how many teachers are just not comfortable with that and feel that maybe they could just do the assignment and the feedback. How are they doing in terms of their uh, learning and how is that impacting the students? Are they getting Zoom? Are they just getting assignments? Are they getting phone calls? What's happening with that? You know what, it's getting late, so just to answer the first one if you want about homelessness and special ed. Well, Rory, I want to talk about all of that. Those are all really important questions. So I'll try to go as quickly as I can to get the answers in. Um, I think that the, you, your first one was homeless and students with disabilities. That, again, we're saying we're connecting with every student, make sure we're reaching every student, making sure that they have what they need to be connected. And sometimes our homeless students are in different set, settings than they were when they left school. But we are finding that we're able to find them and connect with them based on our partnerships with all the community organizations helping us find the students and get them connected for learning. Our students with disabilities, um, there's a whole long story about that, but I want to make sure that you're able to connect with it's important that our students are able to connect with their educational specialist, their case manager, and their related service provider that will be consulting and collaborating with the parents and guardians in an effort to provide every single child with the access to the curriculum and instruction that they need. The setting is different. The student is learning from home, and in that different setting needs to be different supports, and that's why they'll, they will be 
um, receiving phone calls from their support providers to say, so how can we help you have a learning environment that's going to work in this new setting. So that's moving on with students with disabilities and our FAQs page and our students with disabilities parent resources has a host of questions and answers that we've been fielding about that. So I, I direct everybody to please look at those resources because I want to say thank you to Sarah Ott and Moira Alberton who's worked with us to make sure that we're uh, meeting the needs of our students with disabilities. Like I said from the beginning, this is about every student getting what they need during this time, not just some students and homeless youth and students with disabilities is of primary importance to us. Um, your next question was about um, credit, no credit. I, Dr. Evans, I know, is wants to talk about, oh, Dr. Evans left. Okay, never mind. Is Dr. Evans still on? Yes. Oh, there, there he is. I know that Dr. Evans would want to talk about why grades matter. Well, well, I think the whole point was some, some places were saying, okay, this is just a lost time, we can't do anything. We want to really make it formal, and so by having the grades, the students are going to take it more seriously. But we also said uh, we're, not, we're not going to harm students in this way, so the, the point was that their grades would be um, you know, frozen from where they were, and they could only improve their grade. We expect them to participate the rest of the year, but we know that they're going to be in very different circumstances as they're going along. So we made the decision that we're going to grade, but we're not going to penalize students because of the, uh, of the shutdown that we have. So, so we think that this, the whole point is we're taking the, the, the material very seriously. We're presenting new material because our ultimate point, as I said before, is to get student more, even, even more than the grade, is to have students ready for the next level. So we want our kindergartners to be prepared for first grade and first grade for second grade. And that's why we're doing this in a more formal way rather than just kind of sitting back and saying, okay, you're there, that, that counts, and that's it. Thank you, Dr. Evans. And your third question, Rory, was about teachers' experiences and some being more or less um, are used to using technology. Because we are a district that does have technology in our classrooms, most of our educators actually do use technology and they understand the use of technology, but this is different than the kinds of technology in the, in the virtual environments. And that's why I said earlier, uh, the thousands of hours that have already occurred in professional development, over 500 sessions and thousands of hours have happened just in this three weeks off launch period. So our teachers are getting the professional development they need around tools like Zoom. And I don't know if Keisha wants to say something about teachers' experience and comfort using the tools and the PD that we've been providing them. Thank you. Um, I, as I said before, our teachers have been spending hours and hours uh, learning new skills, uh, learning these new online learning platforms. But I also want to remind you that our teachers have uh, had our, these students for almost an entire year. So our teachers know their students best. Um, they know what resources their families have, and they and they really know what is best for their families. So. Just because a teacher is not doing Zoom calls every single day doesn't mean that they're not providing um, educational opportunities for their students. They're giving their students what they know is best for their students and their families. So I would caution people from comparing what your students are getting from their teachers versus what you're getting um, from your teachers because it, it really does depend on what's best for those students. Everyone is getting sort of an individualized um, classroom-based uh, experience because our teachers know um, what works best and again that also comes back to communication I would encourage parents to communicate with their teachers if they're not getting what they need um, thank you Keisha I think that's important um, to note the difference between because I know that I go in thinking zoom is better than getting assignments but you're absolutely right that may not be true and John the question was about credit, no credit. Did you evaluate the credit, no credit situation? That would still account for kids being able to keep their grades and in fact move forward to start fresh and uh, make sure that they do well in the fourth semester or the last 10 weeks of school. Yeah, well, we, we're, you know, we're a little different than Poway in terms of our calendar. So we have a semester and it was obviously interrupted on, on March 16th when we stopped. So. So we certainly looked at uh, credit, no credit was, uh, was an option, but we, we really wanted the students to delve into the new material. And as long as, I mean, part of the credit, no credit idea was to not penalize students. So we knew that with this, this grading policy that we have, that we're not penalizing anybody, but people can actually move ahead. 
maybe somebody didn't even do very well the first part of the semester and they really get into the distance learning and they really demonstrate that they're mastering the material, we want them to be able to get the credit, I mean by that the grade credit, even in terms of yeah. grade point average, because we want them to strive for excellence as opposed to we showed up and we got credit. That's, that's the whole point. And we did take that in consideration. Great, thank you so much um, everyone for joining us, for our speakers, for our reporters. I think uh, we'll be respectful of everyone's time and if anyone has any follow-up questions, please uh, reach out to me and I'll help you get those questions answered. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Bye. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thanks to everyone.